Genesis 25, turn there. Ask you a question tonight. How much of your life does God know about? Did he hurt himself up there? John, you're all right. He's all right. He's all right. He's all right, Derek. Oh, okay. Because we're going to find out in Genesis 25 that God knows everything. Even before it happens, God knows a person's... And this is something that I've learned from the Bible, having, you know, different thoughts taught to me while I was in Bible college. You learn about... Um, you learn Calvinism, you learn Arminianism, you learn all the different isms. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you learn predestination. You learn all these doctrines. And then you're going, okay, which one's right? Uh, and so what I did a few years ago was I just studied the scriptures. I want to know what's right. I want to know whether I have anything to do with my salvation or not. Do I have a choice in this? Or has God already just pre-selected me and that's how it's going to be? So in Genesis 25, we have a sort of a picture of that and we have the answer in scriptures. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll begin our study. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your hand upon us tonight. We thank you, Lord. The songs were great. We ask you, God, Lord, to lead us and guide us into your study. Thank you, God, that you know the beginning, you know the end, you know everything in between about us. There is nothing that is a mystery to you about my life, which means, Father, that one of these days I'm going to have a choice of a road to walk down, and you're going to want to lead me down one, and my flesh is going to want to lead me down another. And I thank you, God, that I can trust you, because you already know what's ahead. Father, just help us, Lord, to put our confidence and our trust in you, that you do actually know what you're doing. And give us comfort in that. So many people, Lord, are in desperate, desperate Ways, Father, because they've been hurt. There's things they don't understand, things they can't see. And I just pray for them tonight, Lord, that they would just simply trust you to know that you would never, you would never mislead them. You would never lie to them. You would always show them the truth. And it's the truth, Father, that sometimes our flesh has a problem with. So, Father, lead us and guide us into your truth. And we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, we find out, we start out in Genesis 25, finding out that after Sarah died, Abraham took another wife. The Bible says in verse 1, Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. Man, how old are you, Abraham? What are you, a hundred and some odd years old? And not only does he take a wife, but he's having children by her. Uh, it only took him, what, 90 years or something like that to give birth to Ishmael. Took him another ten and some odd years to give birth to Isaac. After a hundred years, he's still going strong. In verse 3, And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. Now, there's a question in my mind. There are two, two different people named Sheba and Dedan. There is a Sheba and a Dedan mentioned in Genesis 10. There is a Sheba and a Dedan mentioned here as being the children of Abraham and Keturah. There is a major prophecy in Ezekiel 37 
that says that there is going to be an invasion of Israel in the last days. And it's, and it's uh, organized by Gog, who is the chief prince of Magog. Now, anytime I see chief prince, I think of a principality. I think of a spirit. Uh, now, some scholars say that that's Russia, that uh, the word chief in Hebrew is Rosh, and that's where they get the word Russia from. And then Magog later becomes Moscow. I don't know about that. I don't know anything about that. I've read that. I've heard that all my life, that Russia is going to try to invade Israel. But I don't know that I would put, I don't know that I'd put money on it. I don't know. But as part of that invasion, there's a group of nations that invades. Gomer, which some say is Germany. And then there is um, Ethiopia, and then Sheba and Dedan are two other nations that are supposed to invade Israel. And again, you have Sheba and Dedan as two of the sons of Abraham through Keturah, and then you have Sheba and Dedan mentioned, I can't remember whose children they are, I think they're from Ham um, in Genesis chapter 10. Uh, but anyway, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim. This is where, this is, this, we know this is where the Assyrians come from. And the Assyrians now are what nation? Anybody want to guess? Sounds like Assyria. Huh? Syria. Okay. And they hate the Jews. Always have hated the Jews. Um, Asherim and Latushim and Leumim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah and Epher and Hanuk and Abida and Eldea. All these were the children of Keturah. Man, that's a lot of kids. Abraham still going strong. And Abraham gave... Now watch this now. He has Ishmael... And he has, uh, let's see, how many direct children? Uh, Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. At least six direct sons from Keturah. Then we have grandchildren, Sheba and Dedan. Then we have Asherim and Latushim and Leumim. And then we have uh, Ephah and Epher, and Hanok, and Abida, and Eldea. Sixteen. Kids and grandkids. And then we have Ardell, Burnell, Raynell, Debiel, Linnell, Odell, Udell, Marcel, Claude Newt, that's the Ledbetters from Jerry Clower's cousins. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think I was being serious? <laughs> Y'all remember Jerry Clower, don't you? Yeah. And, the, and the Ledbetter family. Ardell, Burnell, Raynell, W.L., Linnell, Odell, Udell, Marcel, Claude, Nugene, and Clovis. I used to listen. Ah, listen, I've got his records. My dad loved Jerry Clower. But anyway, um, let's see, in verse uh, 6, but the sons, let's see, in verse 5, after all of these, he's got like 16 kids and grandkids from Keturah. We have Ishmael and his offspring. But, verse 5, very important. Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Everything to Isaac. Why? Because Isaac was that child of promise. And if I'm right, especially Asherim, Sheba, Dedan, these are all nations, well, Sheba is Ethiopia. These are all nations that despise 
Israel. Would that not go all the way back then? You have Ishmael and all of his descendants. You have the children of Keturah and all of their descendants who received absolutely nothing of, Israel, of Abraham's inheritance, Isaac receiving everything of it. And of course, that's a picture. Isaac is us, those who are children unto Abraham by birth or by adoption, by faith then we receive all the inheritance. Not even the angels, not even the angels will inherit what we inherit. Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, now we find out he's got concubines. Abraham gave gifts, and that's kind of like when you get called down on the price is right, and you bid wrong, all six times, you never make it up on stage, you at least get a blender out of it. <laughs> or makeup. They give you a consolation prize just for being on the show. And you're going, yippee, I could have had that brand new car. Okay. He gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward and unto the east country. Told him, get away, from this is my son. This is his land. You're not to live on it. He possesses it all. Um, verse 7, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived in 100, threescore and 15 years. 175 years old. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age. An old man full of years was gathered to his people and his sons Isaac and Ishmael. It's the last time probably these two guys came together. Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave. And, and let, me, let me just draw your attention. Isn't it true? Especially in some families. Now I, hope, I hope it's never true in my family. But in some families, They've hated each other for so many years. They get together and yeah, they'll agree to carry the old man out in the coffin. And that's the last they're going to have to do with any of them. That's how it is. Now, I, I, I guess I've just been taught a different way, blessed a different way. Uh, my grandparents on my dad's side and my grandma on my mom's side um, there's no bad blood between any of us none and um, when we gathered for my dad's mom's funeral she was the first to go I mean it was cousins hugging cousins crying all over each other good to see you again and um, the same with my mom's mom when she when she passed away, all my all my cousins, I, th I think except one, who had a drug problem all her life, she she didn't come, but the rest of the family did, and just loved on one another. And my I've got uh, on my mom's side, my mom's mother, she has two grandsons that are preachers. And when I found out my grandmother died, I called him and I said, look, you, you know, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to try to get in the way. You were there closer to her. If you want to preach the funeral, you preach the funeral. I'm not even going to get into that. You know, I, I took part in the service, sang some music and, and so on. But I didn't fight him over that. That's nonsense. And then when my, uh, when my closest aunt died, um, my dad's sister, um, I went down there. Me and Lisa, we went down there. And they, they were glad to see us. And then when, my, when her husband, my uncle, passed away last year, we just happened to be in Arkansas. But we drove down to 
Jacksonville to be part of the funeral and, and they were saying so glad you could see us and and it's just always been that way to me blood blood kin is blood kin it means something I know it's not that way in every family because sometimes families get into it and they fight and they separate and everything like that and you sort of see that in Abraham and Ishmael Ishmael mocked Isaac Ishmael and Hagar both mocked Isaac and Sarah and they laughed and scorned and mocked them and Abraham had to put them out over it and they come back this one time to to be the pallbearers for dad to take him to uh, the cave of um, the cave of Machpelah where Sarah was and and bury him that's probably the last time they saw each other that was it. You see it also in Jacob and Esau too. But anyway, that's down the road. And his sons Isaac, Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zoar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. Now I had a thought uh, earlier when I was studying this and thinking about it. The cave of Machpelah, it, it bears some significance in the Bible, and I'm not 100% sure what it represents, but I know that Abraham, Sarah was buried there, Jacob was buried there, Isaac was buried there, and, there, and there's probably a couple others. If I remembered right, there was like six, six of them buried in that one cave. And I, I kind of thought possibly that the cave of Machpelah Anytime you have a cave, a hole, a pit, you're going down into the earth. Well, where do we know? Remember when Lazarus died and the rich man died. Where did Lazarus go? Abraham's bosom. So I, I just sort of thought possibly that the cave of Machpelah was sort of a an earthly representation of the place that Abraham's soul went to that God had prepared, a purchased place for Abraham and all of those who were his by faith that died. We know that everybody who lived by faith before Christ, their soul went to a place of comfort. David was there. Solomon was there. Elijah, well, Elijah's in heaven. Elisha was probably there. The, Lazarus was there. They all went to this place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. I think possibly represented by the cave of Machpelah. But the Bible doesn't actually come out and say that, but that's just kind of a thought that I had. Now let's move on. Verse 11. They came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. Now, before I read this list, as I'm reading it, I want you to count it. Okay? The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth. And Kedar, and Abdiel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Massa, and Hadar, and Tima, and Jatur, and Naphish, and Kadima. How many did you come up with? Twelve. Now, we're, we're trying to work out uh, this man that Lisa and I met, um, Kamal Salim is his name. He is a Lebanese Muslim jihadist terrorist. Used to be. God has saved him. And I, I believe it. I met him on two. He absolutely loves me. He was so blessed to hear the things that I was saying. He's hugged me. And, and so we are, we're trying to work it out with him and with Southwest Radio. 
that he comes here to speak. Um, and he and I shared the exact same idea about the children of Ishmael. The fact, when I read this, the fact that he had 12 sons, that's the same number of sons Abraham, that Jacob had. It's the number of the apostles. That number is a, is a promise number. Jerusalem above, the new Jerusalem, 12 gates, 12 foundations. It's got 12s all over it. In fact, the word Jerusalem in the New Testament is 144 times exactly. 12 times 12. That's perfect. The perfect number for Jerusalem. And, and I had this teaching that I go through the Bible and, and show you. I believe that the offspring of Ishmael will be saved in the last days. Now, wouldn't it be a glorious act of God to open the eyes of 1.5 billion Ishmaelite Muslims and for them to forsake Allah and the Kaaba and their jihad and their hatred of the Jews and Christians and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. That would be the neatest thing in the whole world. So, coming soon to a theater near you. That's my th and it, when he came when he came to me with that idea, my jaw dropped and I went, oh, "I can show you that in the Bible." Uh, now, verse 17, and these are the years of the life of Ishmael, and hundred and thirty and seven years, and he gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, and they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria, that is Syria. Syria is right on the north of Israel, and there's, if you study the, the 20th century, 21st century, well, you remember the Beirut bombing of our marine barracks, Chris. You remember that, Roy? We should have never let that go unscathed. But Beirut is, it's always been a, 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 a sewage of corruption. Beirut, that, where that explosion took place, Killed all those people, destroyed, destroyed their whole country's grain reserves. That was because some, uh, some corrupt port official took custody of a ship that was carrying ammonium nitrate fertilizer and was holding it ransom for money, for, for, if I remember right, and they lo offloaded it into that warehouse and stored it next to fireworks. Yeah. Huh? It, it, was, uh, it was awful. I watched a video of the, the scene afterwards, people with their cameras out showing what all had happened. Dead bodies everywhere, pieces of bodies laying everywhere. People's houses destroyed, people's businesses destroyed. Why? Because of corrupt officials. And the people protested and the people who were in the government, they were all hiding and, and pointing the fingers at one another. Those places are so corrupt in their government. They allowed that to happen. And if we're not careful, we're going to have that same kind of corruption. It's already working in that direction. We're going to have that same kind of corruption in this country too. But anyway, uh, Assyria and died in the presence of all his brethren. Uh, verse 19, and these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. And the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, 
the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now watch this. This is where we first learn, really, of God's foreknowledge. The children struggled together within her. She's got twins. And those twin boys, they're not identical twins. Because they definitely don't look like one another. Okay? And the children, while they were in Rebecca's womb, were already fighting each other. Because there's not a lot of space in there. Okay? And they were duking it out already. Just listen, I want my leg to go there. And, and um, the children struggled together with her and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Now watch what the Lord said. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Now I want you to underline that word nations. He, God means exactly what he says. There are two nations in this world right now. The children of God and the children of the devil. Two nations. And I want you to notice the difference. God even made them look different to show you this. <clears throat> Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. God already knows this. And one, the one people, shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, turn to Matthew 13. Now, I want you to think about this. Brother Chris, when you were born, who's older, you or your brother? The one I met yesterday. Okay. So when, when you were born, what was I going to ask you? Okay, you, you've, had, you've had your first birth some 80-something years ago. But then, later on in life, you had a second birth, didn't you? Okay? Now, so two people abiding in the same physical space the older man and the new man. And who serves who? The old man serves the new man. The new man in you is Christ. Remember what he said. The elder shall serve the younger. Your old man was born first. Later on, your new man. And the old man says, I ain't going to church. I ain't going to read my Bible. I ain't going to pray. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that like I used to do. And the new man says, oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. We're going to church today. In fact, we're going to pray. In fact, we're going to read our Bible. And all them places that you used to go to, you're not going to them anymore. I'm in charge now. Say amen to that. That's good. Okay? This Bible, it has su such depths of understanding by just saying this one thing. Then Matthew 13 we have the, um, the story of the, the wheat and the tares. 
In verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and, and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And if we skip on down, um, we find out that, let's see here, where is it? The enemy had done that. Uh, where does he give the, the meaning of the parable? Yeah, in verse uh, 38, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The old Adam was born first. The second Adam was then born. The old Adam serves the second Adam. Amen? He serves the Lord. And it's the same here. The old man serves the new man. Two nations, two different manner of people are born. And God already knows who that is. He knows that Esau is going to be born first. Then he knows Jacob is going to be born. But he knows that Jacob is going to choose the right and Esau is going to trade in his, his inheritance for something that's temporary, for just the, the, the desires of the flesh is what he did. See, yeah, he was hungry. He said he was dying. He wasn't dying. It takes like 40 days to die from hunger. He, he just made that up. He could have waited and kept his birthright. But Esau was so guided by his lust, by his desires, by his wicked ways, that he lost his inheritance. And now he has to serve the younger brother. Um, turn to, I made some notes here. Very quick. It, it just hit me while I was up there playing the piano. Turn to Malachi 1. Malachi 1 verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Look what he says in verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved, I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Why did he hate Esau? Esau represents the old man. Where is the old man going? Old man's going to hell. The old man's going into the ground. The old man's going to turn back to dust. And look what he said. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Dragons are devils. And the old man's life, he's just going to be surrounded and filled with devils, dragons. Yet he loved Jacob. Now he quoted this same thing in, in Romans chapter 9. Turn there. Romans chapter 9. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Look at verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because, are the, are, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for seed. See, you, hear, you see the two nations here. Um, and then he says, um, verse 9, For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, I, uh, Abraham already had Ishmael, but Ishmael was the firstborn, wasn't he? Isaac was the secondborn. 
your first old man was born first, your new birth was second. And then verse 10, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the promise, that the purpose of God according to the election uh, might stand, not of works, but of him that called us. So even in this, we're told that this is teaching us also that salvation doesn't come by works. God had already chosen Jacob and not Esau before either one of them had done any work whatsoever. Can you sin in the womb? No, it's not possible. There's no knowledge of good and evil in the womb. It takes, you know, a few years for the child to grow up in the world before that. So, on that count, while they're still aborting babies, they're filling heaven, the way I see it. But according to election might stand uh, not the work, not of works, but of him that calleth. And it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For, who he, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And if you were to take these verses right here and line them up with like Roman Catholic doctrine, Catholic doctrine falls completely apart. Because Catholic doctrine says that the church says you're saved or not saved. The church says you're forgiven or not forgiven. The church says, have you done this? And if you've done this, then your sins are forgiven. If you have not done this, then your sins are not forgiven. The whole doctrine falls on these verses right here alone. Aren't you glad you are come out of that long time ago? Amen. Now go back, go, go back to uh, Genesis 25. And I'm going to close this off. See, God even marked them both. In Genesis 25, verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Well, we already knew that. And the first came out, what color? Why red? Why red? Huh? Though your sins be as... Though they be red like crimson. He came out red. And the Hebrew word for that is Adam. Adam and Edom are the same name, same word. Because they speak of the red clay of the earth. That's why Adam was called Adam. It means Dirt, red dirt. And all over like a hairy garment. That means a beast. A beast. He was of a beast nature. And they called his name Esau. And after that came out came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter. So was Nimrod, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Already you have a family split right here. See, because Rebecca has been, I don't know if Rebecca ever told Isaac what God had told her about those two children. But she already knows that they're going to be completely different. And Rebecca, being the mother and, and sort of sensing things, she knows which one. God is going to bless, I believe. She picks Jacob. Uh, I'm going to throw this in too, and then we'll quit. 
it is obvious to me that not, not only just in the typology of Jacob and Esau do you have the, the picture of you know, lost people and all of that and saved people. But you also have two men. One of them is full of testosterone. Macho, got muscles. He probably kills deer by running up to them and grabbing them by the throat and holding them until they're dead. Uh, he is all man. And then you have Jacob. Jacob, we would call a mama's boy. He's at home and he learns how to cook. And he learns this and he learns that. And in today's world, with the predominance of sodomites everywhere, sodomites would pick this young boy out and queer him up for life. But just because, and let's be truthful, there are some boys who are born slightly more effeminate than others. That does not, we have it right here in the Bible, that does not absolutely mean that they are destined to become homosexuals. I believe they are turned that way. Usually by a close neighbor or a close family member. That's what I believe. It's always going to be, there's always going to be guys that are born that are not as muscular, macho, hair all over their back type men. Okay? That does not mean that they've got to turn out sodomites. How many children did, how many wives did Jacob have? He had two wives and two concubines. Produced 13 children. Clearly, he's not, he does not have the tendency toward other men. The Bible said that the love that David had with, um, who was Saul's son? Huh? Jonathan. The love that David had toward Jonathan was closer than that a man has for his wife. Which the Sodomites look at that verse and say, see, they were queer like us. No, it does, uh, no, uh-uh. It was a true love between two men who loved each other and would have given their life for each other. It was not the defiled love that this world has turned love into. Okay? So... I, I admit, when I was in school, there were, there were boys that, you know, somebody said, oh, they look gay to me. And then all the guys, the locker room guys, join in on the thing. And sure enough, you find out that they're homosexuals. I think the pressures of this world probably had a lot to do with that. And God forgive me for ever participating in that. Let's stand to our feet. Kind of makes you be careful about judging people. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings. Upon your word tonight, I can't say, Lord, that everything I said tonight was right, but we know your word is always right, and your word guides us in the truth. I pray, Father, Lord, that you would guide us and give us understanding, Lord, of your election. Give us understanding, Father, that you truly save us, not by our works, but by your grace and your mercy. And, Father, you know the outcome of all the decisions of our life. 
that ultimately we would choose life. And Father, we pray, dear God, that your word would go forth from this place and speak wisdom to people and guide them in their life. Save somebody this week, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.